Good morning, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us on the MedTech 20 today. It's a real pleasure to have you on and uh, looking forward to having a really interesting conversation exploring uh, all the various facets of HR that you've had in your career and uh, HR in general. So uh, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks a million. I'm really excited to talk to you. <laughs> good, good. Good. So, um, you know, right at the beginning, I think it w would be interesting to talk about is the role of HR has really uh, changed considerably, I would say, in the, in the last 10 years or so, really moving from more of a kind of a, the traditional HR function of being a service to the business to, to really growing into becoming that strategic uh, partner to, to the leadership and the rest of the organization. But what do you see as the future of HR? It, let's say if we look out 10 years, how do you see that development kind of continuing on? Yeah, I think um, for me, it's really, really important that we continue to be that true business partner. I 100% agree that we provide HR, uh, provides a service um, uh, to a certain degree, but we provide most service as a business partner. And for, for HR people, I think we have to keep focused on the business acumen side. I think we have a lot of change coming up in the next 10 years um, in the way we do business. I mean, you can see how COVID impacted us so dramatically over the last um, uh, six to nine months. And I think that has changed even the way we work today. But, you know, providing flexible working um, environments um, and keeping people People motivated and connected like interpersonally from a HR perspective would be really important. HR has to be there right there in the middle um, with the business partners, um, uh, helping them adapt and making sure that we keep employees at the center of what we do. Um, because it's very easy to kind of, you know, get so caught up on what the business needs to do. But we also need to remember that um, we can only only deliver that with our employees um, and therefore they have to be part of that um, solution. COVID is obviously a kind of a hot topic of the day and with, with good reason but um, um, you know I think you and I have had some conversations about crisis and they can take uh, various shapes and forms and uh, I guess that maybe COVID has really kind of highlighted the need for um, really good planning around business continuity and, and really um, good planning just generally around uh, crisis management so maybe you could tell us a little bit about the key learnings that um, that, that you've had over the last uh, six months or so so I think in COVID times, you need um, obviously a basis of good, strong HR competencies. Um, uh, but things like uh, organization agility and um, interpersonal savvy is essential because you need to feel the heartbeat of the organization in those crisis times. You need to make sure that um, you know how people are feeling, you know what needs to be done from a business perspective, but you also need to be able to anticipate changes and problems. So I think looking at the competency side is really important and making sure HR um, has a good foundation of HR competencies, being able to leverage those right um, uh, competencies at the right moment, staying close to your business, staying close to your employees, anticipating where things are going to be problematic, that uh, we are, as an organization, seen as compassionate and are compassionate to employees. Um, you know, even even just the basics of anticipating, you know, what what employees will need when they work from home. I think a lot of uh, organizations got caught very quickly because they had talked about flexible working, but actually hadn't done flexible working. And I think, for example, my own organization, it was a huge impact on the organization when everyone started working from home. Um, I personally had been used to it, but they, most of our corporate organization had not um, had that flexibility. And so even um, our own CEO, um, Paul Desayon, was um, our first president who was 
appointed virtually um, during the COVID times. He was appointed in March um, and it was done virtually. We moved with the, our organization moved with the times um, and that's exciting, I think. Um, and so that's the other part of the crisis management piece is um, there are things that you're never going to have done before. And um, it brings me back to the concept at which I always love, which is learning agility and it's about learning um, from experience and being able to apply that experience in the next scenario. And I always think crisis management is, is exactly like that. Um, you hope to react in the right way, but there'll be always things that you're not used to or that you haven't experienced. You know, one of the key things for me out of the crisis management and COVID is what have I learned from it? Um, you know, what have I experienced and thought, oh, wow, you know, I never experienced that before. Uh, why, how do I prepare for that the next time? Um, so really important to keep that in mind as you move forward, because it's really easy to move on from a crisis and not do the lessons learned. If you can prepare yourself for that next scenario, it'll look different, but you'll have learned the skills. So Amy, you've worked uh, throughout your career across a, a number of the different uh, pieces of the HR function. You've been both kind of a, a generalist um, and, and then had some specialties as well, but um, your, the role that you're in today is more focused on the talent management and development side of things. Um, obviously, talent management is a fairly uh, broad ranging function. You're working with uh, people at all uh, levels within the business. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, you know, what makes a good talent management and development function? Um, and, and how do you really address the needs, um, you know, of the people that are just starting there and the leadership and, and that whole range in between? I think talent management um, has always been uh, even through my HR uh, career part, talent management has always been a really central in what I did every day. Um, for me, talent management is, is like, it's like a sports talent scout. You're there to help individuals kind of gain that experience. You can identify them early or mid-career, depending on when they join your organization, but being able to identify those that you want to focus on. The reality is for every organization, you can't, you can't focus on every employee. What you want to do is give every employee the tools to focus on their, on their career. But there's certain individuals that you have to focus on um, for key roles in the future. Um, and so the skill for me as a talent scout is being able to identify who are those people um, and ha being able to develop their career strategically. But as we talk about those people, um, we also, we meet them on a consistent basis. Um, so we stay very close to their um, career. And so we make sure that um, we talk to them every quarter to we check in with them to make sure that they're progressing well. So not just on the day to day stuff, um, but also what they're doing from a career perspective. So for example, when they start to think about what happens in five years time, where I would li like to see myself within the organization, the talent person will it will be able to see a much broader scope for them um they also will be able to be their contact over you know a 5 10 15 year career within an organization and for me that's really important that we can they can also leverage us to identify what development actions that they might want to take we don't expect managers to be talent experts. And so for our key talent, we need a talent person to look after them from an ongoing perspective and from a career perspective and encourage them to see outside the box. Um, because for example, from an Essler perspective, and this goes for most organizations, I think, um, we're a complicated organization and trying to navigate the organization is one of the, the biggest challenges. I also think, talent sometimes is like an air traffic controller. Um, 
um, you know, sometimes we, we have to set them in the right direction, point them in the, the, the right direction to, to, to get where, where they need to go. It's a more focused role than, than HR, obviously, but still a, a very important skill that you need from a HR perspective as well. There is a part of the talent organ or talent management piece, which is um, uh, encouraging people to own their own careers in whatever way that they do, right? And that's at any stage of your career development. And one of the approaches that we've changed actually this year is looking at um, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Sandberg's um, approach to um, career development as it's a jungle gym, not a, a career ladder. And I really like that because I think it, um, it doesn't matter whether you're early career, mid career or late career. You can start a new um, uh, job opportunity in later career or you can be um, developing a new career in your or new uh, opportunity in mid career. Um, and I think sometimes as and a lot of organizations are, uh, do this, is that we're so focused on millennials or early career people that we sometimes forget that you can start a new career, uh, at, you know, 20 years in and do anything you want to do. And that's really important. And I think it actually probably drives um, some longer term employees within organizations mad because, you know, you hear so, so much about millennials and Gen Z's and all of that, and which are important, don't get me wrong, but we, we should be able to provide career opportunities for everyone at every level. And I think to keep employees motivated, you have to be able to provide that for, for people. Um, and so it doesn't have to be a career ladder. It can be expanding your current scope or expanding your current experience, or you could be really happy in what you do and you excel in what you do um, and you bring value. And to me, that's the moment when when you become that true mentor um, is when you're really happy in the role that you're in and that you're not looking for, you know, the drive to the next thing. That's when you really truly become a good mentor because you have no agenda other than helping that, that individual grow. Um, and I think I love that. Um, you know, there's many people within the organization, within my own organization that I feel are true mentors to me um, that have no agenda, but they just want to look after um, uh, look after my career development, um, and I think that's really special. Uh, absolutely, I think that's uh, that, that's a great uh, way of looking at things. Everybody uh, within an organization has the opportunity to contribute value, uh, whether they're kind of gunning for a, a leadership position or not. And providing the right development opportunities for people, I think that's that's really where where you need to fulfill the expectations of each employee. So um, we're on the MedTech 20 here and uh, you work for a uh, kind of a hybrid medical device company that also uh, obviously has some retail applications as well. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit about what, what you think are some of the um, unique aspects of uh, the HR function within a medical devices company. I mean, obviously there's, um, you know, the regulatory framework that uh, medical devices have to adhere to, um, you know, the, the, the nature of the markets being served. In other words, the, the users of the devices, um, you know, patients or people in need of some kind of healthcare solution. So in your experience, what would you say are some of the specific issues perhaps that, uh, that medical devices uh, companies face from an HR perspective? So from my own experience, um, for the eye care industry, it's, um, it's really interesting because our biggest, I feel our biggest challenge is sometimes um, employees don't always connect what they make to actually to a customer and to really connect with that customer. What a huge impact they have on, on somebody's life. Um, until you're challenged with uh, eyesight issues or, um, or one of your family members are, are, are challenged with eyesight issues, 
um, you don't really understand the impact of what we do. I think connecting that for employees from a HR perspective is sometimes challenging. So I think, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work over the years on um, making sure that, for example, each job that goes through the facilities, um, especially the prescription labs, that they understand that it's like your granny's pair of glasses, um, that you want to make sure that they're perfect for, for your, your parent or your um, uh, grandmother. Um, so I think it's really important uh, that they connect to that messaging and to connect to that to what we do. The interesting thing about the optical um, side is that it really is a customized product made in a mass manufacturing environment. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you think about um, your pair of glasses, right, you choose your, um, the type of lens that you have, um, so how thin it's going to be, what, um, ha, what kind of um, prescription um, that you have. Your prescription is individual to you. You choose your frame, you choose what coatings go on um, your lenses, so whether you want an anti-reflective coating, whether you want, a, for example, a transitions type lens where um, it's a photochromic lens. So each individual product comes in with all those choices um, and it has to be um, cut into the frame and so it really is that customized approach and therefore quality, you know, getting it right first time is really, really important. And it's so challenging from a production perspective. I think for me, the connection with that medical device um, is the value that it brings um, to the, from an employee's perspective to an individual who can see better. You know, I always see the, the there's a couple of different videos you'll see online of um, babies actually putting on a pair of glasses for the first time where they can see their parent. I think it's, it's the true reason that you do the job that you do um, from an Essler perspective is like watching that um, interaction and watching them uh, understand um, what it's like to see the world. So I think one, that is one of the challenges um, for any organization in MedTech is connecting that customer experience with um, and the impact that it has um, and understanding all those regulatory requirements are sometimes painful but they're there there's a reason that we have them there's a reason that it, because they're going on a, a person or going into a person and therefore we have to make sure that it's perfect we have to make sure that it's um it's the right thing and so when you connect those dots i think for employees it makes a, a big difference um rather than being focused on the regulatory side um actually have them focus on like what it's like to use the and what impact your your product has on on their daily life, um, I think that makes a huge difference from a HR perspective. Even though yes, there's challenges, um, I think you have the ability to um, change kind of the messaging for your employees to say, look, I know these are challenging things that we have to do, but there's a reason for them, and the reason is that you know people's lives are at risk and helping them them have a better life is so much ben more beneficial than worrying about the small regulatory things that you have to do. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I think I need some non-reflective glasses, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed on, on the podcast. Uh, Don't worry. We'll, <laughs> we'll be able to tell you all the right ones to get. <laughs> Good. So there's uh, obviously been maybe the last five years or so a, a real um, concerted effort um, to create more inclusive and, and diverse workforces. Um, you know, I think we're probably closer to the beginning of that journey than to really achieving those those goals. But I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, your thoughts on how do we drive more diverse talent uh, into the STEM fields. Yeah, it's always such interesting um, thing because I, I do think to your point um, we're probably at the early stages even though um, a lot of work have be, has been done but I think we have a lot of work to do. 
um, you know, when I think I joined our US um, part of the Esler organization and it was, um, it was on the manufacturing side, there was some commercial um, people part of the team, but I was the only female in the first, I remember the first dinner um, sitting with 30 men and me and uh, I remember thinking, we need to recruit some women. Um, uh, um, uh, it was it was so interesting, and so I think every single one of them made me feel comfortable. But it it hit home to me, and that was okay. That was ten years ago, um, and we ha I could definitely could see some really great progress. But one thing we saw, I saw a lot, was um, we had quite a few women on the commercial side, but not as much on the operations side. Um, so I think really. Um, making that impact has to be around the talent acquisition side um getting obviously going back a step further is getting women into stem uh courses uh obviously that is a huge area but from a company perspective i think making sure that uh, when we bring in talent um into the organization that early career talent particularly um that we have a, a good gender diversity within that and i think the only way we do that is one making sure that you have gender diversity in your interview panels and that you do force a certain amount of you know hiring balance with the number of male females in that you actually hire as well you want to get the best mm, people for the job absolutely but you do have to drive it a little bit um uh to make sure that you have um you hire on a good um gender balance the other part of that is not just um focusing on obviously hiring people but also developing the females that you have uh within the organization so making sure that they get true sponsorship um making sure that um our language when we talk about um, we talk about people at talent review, for example, that our language is gender neutral. So, you know, one thing I've I've looked at over the last number of years is how we describe males and females um, and how managers describe them at talent reviews. And there is a distinct difference. Um, and it's it's that unconscious bias that we we struggle with um, today. Um, so it's not overt and it and I, and don't get me wrong, I don't think anyone goes out of their way to think like this, but I think it's it's our opportunity as a HR organization to train people to think about the words that they use to describe our talent in our organizations. The other thing I think about on diversity is not just about gender, it's about, you know, race and nationality and age, particularly, I would think we talked a little bit earlier about making sure that you have development opportunities at all um, at stages of your career. Um, sometimes we're, we are too focused on Gen Z and, and millennials. Um, and you know of course as a future organization you need those people to grow to provide you with talent and leadership in the future right so you have to invest in them but you also have to invest in other parts of of your uh your population as well so it's really important that when we do think about a diversity we don't just think about gender it, hugely important, but definitely not the only thing. One of the most influential people I ever worked with was a lady called uh, LaShonda reed -Larry. Um, She was our diversity and inclusion leader. And uh, she taught me so much about thinking about things differently when it came to diversity and inclusion. Um, I absolutely loved her because um, she really challenged our organization to think about things differently. So, Amy, you've had a really uh, interesting career. You've, you know, you spent uh, quite a lot of time, obviously, in Europe and, and Ireland, and uh, and then you also spent a reasonable portion of your career in in the U.S. as well. So, I'd love to hear from your vantage point if if you see um, any kind of differences, really, in the in the HR practices between the the different regions. Yeah, so I have to say, I absolutely loved working in the US. I love working in Ireland as well, but I had a wonderful experience in uh, in the US. I think, honestly, the US 
taught me how to be a true HR business partner. I think it, it really helped me kind of be integrated into the business. I think it was probably one of the leaders that I worked with as well. Um, he was very supportive of HR. So, um, but it really did teach me how to partner with the business. I would say um, the legal implications um, of for the employee. So, for example, the fact that you can terminate an employee quite quickly um, in the US um, does lead to one insecurity. Um, and for example, notice period is usually like two weeks um, if you're lucky. So um, those kind of things do kind of impact your day to day um, when you're managing an organization. Um, so um, employees become less kind of, I won't say loyal because it's not really the right word, but they become less connected with the organization and can move on quicker. Now, there's huge benefits to to it because managing people, poor performers within your organization, there's a big benefit to be able to manage that quickly. Um, but sometimes you can manage it too quickly and actually never deal with the underlying issue. Um, so there really is a huge dichotomy of, of um, approach when it comes to HR in the US and, and Europe and legally um, what works and doesn't work. It, I would say Europe is definitely much more process um, uh, focused on, especially on the disciplinary side. And to be honest with you, I, I value that as, as an employee, I value that. I, I think, you know, um, looking at, uh, you know, having that security as, um, as an individual, as an, uh, as an employee is an, is an important one. So thanks so much for sharing everything that you have today, Amy. It's been, it's been really interesting. Um, I guess one final question that uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on is, is what do you see as the role of, of technology in terms of HR in, in the future? I mean, you hear talk about AI and, and uh, talent identification and all these kinds of things, but uh, from, a, from the broader HR perspective, what do you see as um, you know, what technology can potentially bring in, in future to the HR function? Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I think it's going to be really exciting. There's so many ways that it, you know, it can impact the way we do business from a HR perspective. So I think there is really great technology to improve the candidate experience, great improvements coming in um, career and development discussions, um, being able to identify functional competencies and development activities um, when you want to move into a certain function. Um, so I think there's huge opportunities in that area. And, and so I think it's up to the or to the HR organization to take that on board um, and actually go with it because I think it brings a lot of information. It doesn't replace that interaction you have personally with people. Um, so I think we have to be careful. You know, I, I, you know, there's many organizations that have everything online from, you know, ADP or, or payroll or all of those things. And they're, you know, they're hugely beneficial for um most people but if you don't know what you're looking at um, it's not beneficial for you so there has to be that human contact to be able to understand um, you know and teach somebody hey you know this is what your payslip looks like this is you know where, where your tax code is um, this is why you're on this tax code so it's really important that we don't forget that personal piece and that we bring the organization with us when we make these developments from a HR perspective. I'm really excited um, for the kind of um, AI side because I think that will actually um, make um, a huge impact um, in our organization. I've seen some organizations have taken this um, already and made huge um, inroads in employee engagement. The kind of predictive analytics with regard to turnover versus employee engagement versus actually digging deep into departments and saying, you know, what is the actual issue in this department. Um, so uh, you see a lot of employee surveys will be kind of very general results for organizations. 
which is fine. You have to get that. But it's, it gets interesting when you start to dig deep into these things. So um, I've seen some organizations move further where they become predictive analytics on like where you see key performance indicators drop um, and you can start to identify where you're going to have turnover. Um, and that's really interesting. We're really working on the, the basics of um, data first um, before we can go to the real analytics side. But you know, once that is done and once an organization has that ability, I think there's huge opportunities for, um, for organizations to move to that predictive analytics. Um, and I think that impacts things like talent acquisition, um, uh, identifying talent, internal mobility. So um, I think there's lots of opportunities within talent management to use that. So I think, honestly, technology is going to change our world um, and continue to change our world. We can see that even with COVID, like, you know, um, we're on a Zoom call now, you know, how we use um, training. We recently ran a internal mobility seminars. Um, we had over a thousand employees join us on career mobility seminars uh, across, three, uh, across three different um, time zones. And, you know, being able to talk to people about their careers, uh, like you never get that opportunity. I would love to be able to go and visit each of them in their countries, but you don't, I, I don't have that ability. Um, so this is the next best thing. And, and embracing that, you say, well, look, we're going to do it. We did the same with our, um, we do an early development program called Comet. It is for that um, kind of early career people that are globally mobile um, that are looking to kind of develop their career and that have good learning agility. Um, this was the first year that we, um, um, my colleague Charlene delivered it um, virtually and um, oh my god just looking at their videos you know um, they recorded all the sessions but looking at their videos they had them all up dancing and all sorts of things like to try and make it fun you know and that's the the key thing for me is you can you can deliver training um, uh, online, um, but it can it may not be effective if it's not fun. And like, there's something about that inter um, personal um, interaction that you have with somebody when it's in person training. You need to replicate that when you do that uh, when you're doing it on GoToMeeting or Zoom or whatever. All those different facilities that you can use from a technology per perspective is really important. And for example, we've another one. Um, um, coming up, which is our career seminars, we're going to do a virtual career fair. And so there's huge technology out there now that you go in and interact with each different part of the career seminar. Um, and you can attend each virtual session, um, you can ask questions, you can have breakout groups, all of that. So we are going to do that for um, a couple of our functions like um, hopefully our marketing and um, uh, finance, we want to make sure that whatever we do from a business perspective, one, it's effective, but also two, it's fun. Well, Amy, it's been a really fun conversation having you on the on the program today, and uh, we certainly covered a lot of different uh, different topics. So I think um, you know I, I, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you have too, and and you know just want to thank you again for joining us on the MedTech Twenty. Thanks so much. I really had a, uh, a good fun talking. It's always my favorite subject, HR. So <laughs> perfect. <laughs>